Formula One is the most technologically advanced sport in the world, with hundreds of designers and engineers at every team constantly striving to shave another fraction of a second off the lap time of their cars. But occasionally, either because of rule changes or because a brilliantly creative engineer comes up with a radical new idea, great leaps forward are made, sometimes overnight, that change the sport forever. Let's take a look at some of the biggest tech shakeups in Formula One history. Curs, or to give it its full name, Kinetic Energy Recovery System, was introduced as part of a major set of rule changes aimed at cutting costs and closing up the competition in 2009. The system was designed to help overtaking and to promote a greener, road-relevant power source working by converting heat generated from braking into energy and storing it in a battery, before that energy was then redeployed as a boost of power when the driver pressed a button on the steering wheel, worth up to 60 kilowatts or the equivalent of 80 brake horsepower for up to 6.6 .6 seconds a lap. So stay off curbs during the run, stay off curbs. Oh, no curbs. No curbs, curbs, as in the side of the circuit. Despite being designed as an attacking aid, it was just as often used to defend as the drivers got used to it. But Kurs also added weight to the car and was tricky to package, which is why when it was first introduced in 2009, championship rivals Braun and Red Bull were among teams to decide against using it as F1's engineers got to grips with the new system. But despite the early teething troubles, Kurs did have an impact on the racing, not least when Kimi Raikkonen used the system on his Ferrari to power past Giancarlo Fisichella, whose Force India car didn't have it, to take victory in the 2009 Belgian Grand Prix. And it also paved the way for today's cutting-edge hybrid power units, which would shape the future of Formula One. Williams would make active suspension famous with their incredible 1992 FW14B car, with which Nigel Mansell swept all before him to roar to the World Championship. But a decade earlier, it was actually perennial pioneers Lotus who first tried out the technology in Formula One. In 1980, Colin Chapman's team were struggling to find a way to cope with the huge amounts of downforce they were now generating which was causing the cars to bounce violently over bumps in the track surface. Lotus engineer Peter Wright came up with a computer-controlled hydraulic system that was so fast-acting it could keep the car at the perfect ride height all the way round a given track. Chapman greenlit the project, but sadly died soon after doing so. The team did run the system twice in 1983, but with Chapman gone, Wright faced a battle to convince the team's drivers and management that it was worth pursuing, and it was shelved. But in 1987, Lotus tried again, though by now Williams had developed a rival system for the FW11B that would go on to outperform the original. Still, it was fittingly the Lotus 99T that became the first active suspension car to win a Grand Prix, when Ayrton Senna drove it to victory at Monaco, and sealing a second successive win at Detroit three weeks later. Senna's compatriot, Nelson Piquet, also used active suspension to take victory at Monza that year as part of his championship-winning campaign that season with Williams continuing to develop this system throughout the following year. Both teams would drop the technology again, but in 1992 it was back, and the Williams FW14B system was now much more developed and sophisticated, and Nigel Mansell rocketed to the title, with Alain Prost doing likewise the following year in the FW15, as the other teams rushed to copy Williams. They needn't have bothered as the FIA banned the technology at the end of the 1993 season. Occasionally, there's a technological revolution in Formula One that changes everything, forever. When the World Championship began in 1950, the car's engines were all at the front. After all, as Enzo Ferrari famously said, the horse should pull the cart, not push it. But in the late 1950s, all that was about to change. 
Because father and son Charles and John Cooper used 500cc motorcycle engines in their light and nimble racing cars, they decided it would be better to situate the engine at the back. Jack Brabham took sixth place at the 1957 Monaco Grand Prix in a rear-engined Cooper. But the little green car with its unconventional motor placement was not taken seriously by the big boys, Ferrari and Maserati with their engines at the front. But the establishment would have a rude awakening the following year, when Sterling Moss took a private Cooper Climax T43 to the Argentinian Grand Prix. It was a lighter, sprightlier car than its rivals, and Moss danced around the track to take the win. It was the first victory for a rear-engined Formula One car, and the racing royalty of the time were stunned. Maurice Trintignant repeated the feat at the next race in Monaco, while Jack Brabham became the first rear-engined F1 world champion in 1959, before winning again in 1960. The rear-engined revolution had begun, and every single champion since then has been sitting in front of his motor, rather than behind it. Lotus founder Colin Chapman is remembered as one of the all-time greats when it comes to racing car design and engineering. And in 1962, he unveiled a new challenger that changed how racing cars would be built forever. Before Chapman, F1 cars all had a load-bearing chassis, with the bodywork built around it. But what Chapman did with the Lotus 25 was to combine those two elements, doing away with the old tubular frame around which the body was wrapped, and instead using one structure for both functions, the monocoque, from a French word meaning single shell. The body of the Lotus 25 itself was now the load-bearing chassis, which weighed just half as much as the chassis of its predecessor, the Lotus 24, whilst being three times stiffer. It was a major step forward, and Jim Clark proved it by racing to the 1963 World Championship and taking 14 wins from 1962 to 1965. The car itself would race on all the way into 1967, but more importantly, it set the template for modern chassis design, and to this day, the monocoque that each driver climbs into before every Grand Prix is based on Chapman's original concept. Turbochargers are not new technology. They had been used successfully at the Indianapolis 500 and Le Mans 24 hours in the 60s and 70s. In simple terms, they work by reusing heat energy from the exhaust gases and forcing air into the engine, which creates more power. In 1977, Renault pioneered their use in Formula One with the experimental RS01. Initially, the car was heavy, cumbersome and chronically unreliable, gaining the nickname the Yellow Teapot because it blew up so often, usually in a cloud of white smoke. But the joke was over two years later, when the RS01's successor, the 1.5-litre V6 RS10, took a brilliant home victory in the French Grand Prix at Dijon at the hands of Jean-Pierre Jabouy. The all-French win, the car, engine, fuel, tyres and driver, all being French, was the first victory for a turbo car in Formula One. And the other teams scrambled to follow suit, with Ferrari, BMW, Honda and Porsche all developing new turbo engines in the following years, eventually leading to the 1,000 horsepower monsters of the mid-1980s as the turbo arms race ensued. Soon the entire grid was turbo-powered, but in 1989, a decade on from Jabouille's game-changing win, the party was over and turbos were banned amid fears the cars were simply becoming too fast. They returned in 2014 as Formula One looked to a more efficient future, and once again, every car on the F1 grid is turbo-powered, alongside the world-leading hybrid technology that creates the world's most thermally efficient engines, quite a long way from the yellow teapot being the laughing stock of the paddock. Like every racing car designer, John Barnard was always trying to come up with ever more ingenious ways of making his car lighter, tighter and more aerodynamically efficient. 
One problem he continually faced was having to factor in a manual gear shift lever, which forced the monocoque to be a certain width. When he joined Ferrari and set about drawing up a new challenger for the Scuderia, his solution not only solved the initial problem, but ended up changing every Formula One car on the grid, and plenty of production road cars as well. His brainwave was to remove the gear lever altogether and replace it with two buttons on the steering wheel, one for up, one for down, that would control a semi-automatic gearbox. Eventually, he went for paddles on the rear of the steering wheel rather than buttons, but the principle remained. To huge skepticism, even from within Ferrari, Barnard persisted with the revolutionary system, and it was a key feature of the Ferrari 640, the team's 1989 car, which famously won on its debut in Brazil, with Nigel Mansell at the wheel. Though the new gearbox would prove chronically unreliable in that first season, eventually its benefits were understood, and within a few years, every team had adopted the same system which they still use to this day, along with dozens of high-performance road cars. In 1977, Colin Chapman revealed his brand new Lotus 78, and though no one knew it at the time, not even the men who designed it, it heralded a new era in Formula One. Ground effect had arrived. It's now a well-understood concept. By shaping the floor in a certain way, you can accelerate the air moving underneath the car, which creates low pressure, effectively sucking the car down onto the track and giving the tires greater grip, with the added bonus that there is no increase in aerodynamic drag that comes with conventional wings. Two years earlier, Chapman, worried that his team was slipping behind the opposition, had written a 27-page document outlining new design concepts, which he then handed to his engineering staff. Working off Chapman's initial vision, they found that placing an inverted wing shape in each of the side pods created two Venturi tunnels, which sucked the car to the ground. But that was only half the story. They discovered if they could prevent the air from escaping from the sides, effectively sealing the low pressure area under the car, the effect became immensely powerful. The Lotus 78 was the result of these experiments and was the car that started the ground effect revolution in Formula One. And though it was a winner in the hands of Mario Andretti and Gunnar Nilsson, it was its successor, the 79, that was the real game changer. With its full-length sliding skirts, which closed the gap between the side pods and the track, it swept the field and took Andretti to the 1978 world title. Ground effect was the key to a new design philosophy in F1, and Lotus's rivals raced to follow suit, with Gordon Murray's Brabham BT46B, the fan car, perhaps the most famous example, sucking air from underneath and creating the low pressure to pin the car to the track. It worked brilliantly, with Nicky Lauda driving it to victory on its debut at the Swedish Grand Prix. But amid political wrangling, Brabham boss Bernie Eccleston withdrew it after just one race. Like many great leaps forward in design, ground effect proved so powerful that the rulemakers became concerned about safety, and it was eventually banned entirely at the end of the 1982 season. But it's hard to keep a good idea down, and in 2022, Ground Effect is returning to Formula One, with the sports chiefs hoping it will help promote closer racing on track, as the new era cars will derive much less of their aerodynamic performance from the bodywork, which is easily disrupted when following another car, and allowing closer wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. Sometimes technical revolutions in Formula One are the result of one team coming up with an idea that proves so effective, all the others have no choice but to follow suit. And sometimes the sports rulemakers mandate a big change in the regulations, and the race is then on to see who can best exploit those new rules and come up with the fastest car. That was the challenge facing all the teams as the 2014 season approached, which saw a step change in engine regulations. Out went the old 2.4-litre V8s, and in came a new generation of 1.6-litre turbocharged V6 hybrid power units, 
as the sport looked to become more relevant to road cars, more efficient and sustainable. They were the most advanced, complex and fuel-efficient power units in Formula One history, with the internal combustion engine responsible for providing some 600 brake horsepower, compared to around 750 brake horsepower developed by the 2013 engines. Sophisticated Energy Recovery Systems, or ERS, would make up the shortfall by harnessing the kinetic energy recovered under braking and thermal energy from the exhaust gases using turbo technology. All this meant the new units used significantly less fuel, just 100 kilograms per race, compared to the 160 kilos used by the previous generation. The question as to which of F1's engine suppliers would master this new generation of power units was answered in spectacular fashion at the 2014 Australian Grand Prix, the first race of the new formula. Rosberg takes the season opener by a long, long way. Come on guys, brilliant stuff. What a car you've given me. What a car, unbelievable. The Mercedes engineers at their Bricksworth Engine HQ had stolen a march on rivals Renault and Ferrari, with the factory team racing to every championship from 2014 until 2021, when Red Bull and their Honda power unit finally defeated the Mercedes juggernaut to seal the driver's title for Max Verstappen, even if the constructors' championship stayed with the Silver Arrows. Mastering the demands of F1's hybrid power unit has been a complex challenge for F1's engine suppliers, but hybrid technology is here to stay, and in the future, Formula One aims to unveil a second-generation unit that will be even more energy efficient, with the target to be carbon neutral and fully powered by sustainable fuel. Halfway through the 1968 season, Lotus turned up at Monaco for the Grand Prix, having made what was an apparently subtle tweak to the already impressive Lotus 49. No one knew it yet, but a revolution in Grand Prix racing had just begun. Graham Hill stuck the car, now dubbed the 49B, on pole, and won the race, as was custom for the man known as Mr. Monaco. But more noteworthy was the addition of a small front wing on the car, jutting out from either side of its nose, the first such device to be used in F1. Before that day, F1 cars had only generated mechanical grip, but Lotus boss Colin Chapman's idea was simple. Take the idea of aircraft wings, designed to create lift, and literally turn that notion upside down therefore creating downforce that would push the car into the track, giving more grip and faster cornering speeds as the car hugged the surface. From the modest wing on Hill's car at Monaco, Chapman and other designers began experimenting with ever bigger and more precariously balanced wings as they discovered just how powerful downforce was in making their cars go faster. Despite some of those early missteps, which pushed and sometimes overstepped the limits of safety until the sport's governing body intervened to curb their development, wings were here to stay, and once the other teams cottoned on, front and rear wings soon became an integral part of every design on the grid. Chapman moved the game on again with the Lotus 72 winged car, which debuted in 1970 and was so advanced, it raced on until 1975, winning the Constructors' Championship three times. The era of aerodynamics was here. In the years since, F1 designers have continued to experiment with some very odd-looking wings hitting the track. The Tyrrell team was responsible for a boomerang-shaped rear wing in 1983, and the so-called X-Wing in 1997. While at the 2001 Monaco Grand Prix, Jos Verstappen had all eyes on him as he trialled a mini-wing on his Arrow's nose cone. Some of the more wacky ideas may not have lasted long, but front and rear innovations most certainly did, and remain key parts of Grand Prix cars to this day. The McLaren MP41 was a car that would change everything in Formula One. Designer John Barnard had served his engineering apprenticeship with Lola before a spell working for racing teams in America. 
On his return to the UK, he hooked up with new McLaren boss Ron Dennis and got to work on a new car. At the time, every team in the pit lane was focused on optimizing ground effect. But after seeing carbon fiber composites being used in aeroplane engine design, Barnard began to investigate the practicalities of using what was then a somewhat mysterious material. So mysterious, in fact, that at first he couldn't find anyone willing to work with him on the project, as no one thought what they termed black plastic would be at all suited to racing car design. Eventually, he found an American firm willing to take up the challenge, and in 1981, the MP41 was born. McLaren's rivals were skeptical, but in its first season, the radical new car would prove itself in two very distinct ways. John Watson took McLaren's first victory in four years, and the first of Ron Dennis's era, when he triumphed at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone. The new car, with its strong but lightweight carbon fiber chassis, was quick. Then at Monza, Watty had a huge crash. His engine and gearbox were ripped off, but his carbon fiber monocoque had remained completely intact, and he walked away unscathed from a 140 miles per hour shunt, which would have hospitalized, or worse, many of his rivals. This experimental new car wasn't just fast, it was a gigantic leap forward in terms of driver safety, and any fears of the chassis exploding in a cloud of black dust were instantly dispelled. Carbon fiber then became the must-have tech in Formula One, and before long every team on the grid was using it, and continues to, to this day, with the material now making up some 70% of the structural weight of a modern Grand Prix car. Formula One can never be completely safe, but carbon fibre has saved hundreds of lives over the years. So John Barnard and the MP41 truly changed F1 forever.